I'll give you a little introduction, Jennifer. So today okay. we have Jennifer Deerberry, uh, who is the chairperson of the House uh, Clinic, uh, past president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, and she's going to talk to us about inflammatory inner ear disease. So Jennifer, thank you for joining today and giving this lecture. You're welcome. So first, I'm going to qualify. This is my first Zoom Grand Rounds PowerPoint meeting that I'm hosting. So I don't, I don't know that there's a Zoom meeting I've been to anyway where there haven't been all types of you know, interesting things like a dog barking, uh, toilet flushing, or something like that. And I'm sure some, this is going to be no exception on this meeting. <laughs> So uh, we're going to be talking about inflammatory inner ear disease, and these are my disclosures, uh, board of directors of the House Ear Clinic uh, Hearing Aid Dispensary and a stockholder in ear limbs. What um, mm -hmm. we'll do in this lecture, uh, we'll d discuss the prepared, we'll discuss the presumed, I should say, pathophysiology of Meniere's and AIED. And I'm going to be going back and forth between the two entities because there is a lot of overlap uh, between them, as you'll see. We'll briefly touch on the immune response of Antarctica's largest land animal. And then finally, we'll end up discussing the current and the uh, potential future treatments of Meniere's NAID. Uh, don't really need to review this. I just think it was interesting that Prospera Meniere's was first a botanist before he went into medicine. And he first published his article concerning patients with hearing loss, vertigo, and tinnitus. Uh, he, would, he defined the source as the inner ear because prior to that, uh, Meniere's is, was considered epilepsy or maybe some sort of an, a mental illness. Um, you know, I'm always asked by patients, as you all are, I'm sure, all the time, what caused my Meniere's disease? And as I put, it's just, you know, go back to Casa Blanca. It's the usual suspects. Uh, every textbook will have them. Every lecture on Meniere's is going to have a, le a slide like this where it's basically... Meniere's can be caused by anything, you know, viral, autoimmune, allergy, mechanical, et cetera. Demographics of Meniere's disease, uh, there are significant differences in the estimates worldwide. And I will qualify that by saying that we often make the diagnosis by committee of Meniere's disease. So that trying to pinpoint what it is can be a little challenging. In the U.S., we presume that there are about uh, 600,000 to 750,000 new cases uh, cases in the U.S. total. Our prevalence, uh, actually prevalence of Meniere's will vary based on the age range you're looking at. If you look at the age group 18 to 34, the prevalence is about 61 per 100,000 uh, individuals. And going up to above age 65, it's 440 per 100,000. The most common onset would be uh, middle years, 40 to 60 years old. There is a slight female predominance in most studies of it. Uh, I'm sure you all ask, you know, what about my family? Are they all going to get Meniere's? There seems to be a familial incidence about 10%. Uh, bilateral, that's going to vary with the studies and also how long you follow a patient with Meniere's disease. As many unilaterals will go bilateral. In the group who also have concurrent allergies, there's about a 40% uh, bilaterality. These, you're going to see slides now from the new clinical practice guidelines from the guidelines from the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And these were just published earlier this year. Um, I was uh, privileged or damned, whichever one you want, to be on that guidelines committee. And uh, there's a little bit of a change from prior definitions of Meniere's, as I'll show you. To have definite Meniere's disease, one must have two or more spontaneous attacks of vertigo. They have to last at least 20 minutes to 12 hours. We formally said 24. We also, the big change is we have to document audiometrically the low to mid-frequency sensory neural hearing loss in the affected ear on at least one occasion guidelines say before, during, or after one of the episodes of vertigo. So basically at any time with a suspected patient, if you have that, it's, uh, that's considered a positive. They have to have the, you know, the usual fluctuating symptoms of hearing loss, tinnitus, or fullness in the ear. And we have to exclude other causes such as uh, neurosyphilis by tests. Probable Meniere's disease, uh, we see a lot of, and on the Electronic records, I'll put in my impression on this, probable uh, or suspected or whatever. 
In this case, it's a little more broad. Uh, we have, again, the same vertigo, two episodes, but the dizziness and vertigo can last up to 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes up to 24 hours, longer period of time. Uh, fluctuating oral symptoms, same thing in the affected ear, and other causes excluded by tests. So in this, we don't have to document it audiometrically, and we're allowed to have a little longer period of dizziness or vertigo. In contrast, a autoimmune inner ear disease, or AIED, is a rapidly progressive, ultimately bilateral, asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss that we presume due to an immune attack on the inner ear or one that fits that rapid progression and is also associated with a systemic autoimmune uh, problem or disorder. Historical background on AIED, uh, definitely more recent descriptions than uh, Meniere's disease. The initial reports were in the European literature in the 1950s, and we knew there was something going on with this unusual hearing uh, presentation where in a rapid time, one could go from some hearing loss to bilateral deafness and with a profound vestibulopathy. There was no known treatment for it until uh, McCabe reported possible improvement with the use of uh, cytoxin, which is a very um, a good immunosuppressant with a whole lot of baggage with it. It is rare, as opposed to Meniere's, or relatively rare, opposed to Meniere's. Uh, less than five out of every 100,000 cases of sensory neural loss um, each year. I put presumed diagnosis of it because we still don't have a definite diagnostic test, but what do we use to in suspected AIED? Well, there are not many things that can cause one to go from normal hearing to say deaf within about three to four months, except for this or perhaps um, an, odor, an odor toxic response. But we have an otherwise unexplained history. The timing is the key, the rapidity of the hearing loss. Presence of other known autoimmune condition, um, we don't see it that much. 15 to 30% of patients who have rapidly progressive loss also have a systemic autoimmune disease. I'm gonna uh, make a point on this, that this is something you have to emphasize with most rheumatologists when you start working with them. Because if they don't find lupus or something and you send them in for hearing loss, they're gonna automatically discount it until you let them know it is an organ-specific immune reaction. Uh, response to cortical steroids, uh, I'll talk about that. I wish that had never been published anywhere, but I will talk about that shortly. The abnormal immune responses, what we would love is a diagnostic test in these patients to know what we're talking about. So of course, what pops up is what about heat shock protein? We already know about that. What is heat shock protein 70? Well, early on it was noted that the SARA of patients with suspected AIED and Meniere's disease and, and certain cases of sudden deafness would often react to guinea pig or bovine inner ear antigens. So there was clearly some antibody floating around there. There's a very wide bell curve with this that would be seen in anywhere from six, uh, 26 to 85% of patients. The antibody was identified as IgG and occasionally IgA. So there was a, you know, a, a study to try to define or identify what the antigen was that was stimulating this antibody response. And what came up was it was most commonly in, in the molecular weights of either 30, 42, or 68 kilodalton. And in particular, 68 came up as most, uh, most common. There was a, uh, I hear some kind of a, okay, I guess it's off now. Uh, that, was an, that was eventually found to be heat shock protein 70. I can tell you there was this big disappointment with that because there was a big race on the east and the west coast to see who was gonna figure it out first. And when it came out to be heat shock protein 70, there was a collective sigh of disappointment. And why is that? Heat shock protein 70 or HSP70 is a member of the heat shock or stress protein families. It is among the most highly conserved families in nature, meaning it is very, very common. Its job is to bind newly synthesized peptides that allows it to control the folding of proteins and then how they're whether or not they're transported across intracellular membranes. 
it is consistently present normally in the body. And it gets the name heat shock protein because an infection may induce antibodies against it that are directed towards the infecting microorganisms. Now, that brings up one of the uh, objectives of this, which is to discuss the largest land animal in Antarctica. And if you were here in front of me and I could ask, I would you know, put you fellows on the spot, at least the junior fellows, and ask you what it was. So not being able to do that, I'll just cut to the chase. I was in, um, my husband and I did one of those bucket list trips a few years ago, five years ago to Antarctica, and it was a great trip if you, if you can do it. I highly recommend it before Antarctica melts. We took a National Geographic cruise, so there was a lot of science and a lot of lectures with it. So one of the days, you know, we spent a half day at one of the scientific stations, and there were researchers going around, and I stopped by, you know, the, the laboratory of one, and I mean, I have to say this guy was like a nerd out of central casting and I, he was expounding eloquently about what he was doing. And just as I'm sitting there thinking to myself, uh, gee, their job's worse than mine. I suddenly kind of in my brain uh, overheard the terms heat shock protein and stress proteins. So I guess the nerd in me came out too. And I said, why don't you show me what you're doing? So it turns out his life's passion was studying the Antarctic midge, which is the largest land animal in Antarctica. It's three millimeters in size. And what he had found was that it was fascinating to him, and actually I thought it was interesting too, was that they contain these heat shock proteins. They have stress proteins. And you know, hence the name heat shock protein. And my husband convinced me to do the polar plunge with him into the Southern Ocean. So I can convince, I, I will tell you, there is no heat in Antarctica whatsoever. But the heat shock protein is in the Antarctic midge and the number one that it has the most prevalent on his PCR strip is heat shock protein 70. So the takeaway from that is, you know, and we'll get out of what it does here, what uh, that will take away from that is it, it, it's everywhere. You will, we don't know if it has any role whatsoever in AIED or Meniere's disease. It was initially felt that it would be, um, it would be like the, the antigen test we would have. It was initially felt that it would not only be specific for AIED, but it would predict steroid responsiveness. And it, it doesn't, you can find it in ulcerative colitis, you get it if you have a sunburn or a fever, hence the name heat shock protein, and you get it in the Antarctic midge. So we have to rely on clinical presentations to diagnose AIED. And uh, Jeff Harris uh, published these, you know, what he felt were the significant presentations. Um, I have to say I have a couple of disagreements with him on this, but for the most part, I think they're quite useful. The classic initially discussed was a rapidly progressive bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. It may also present as a bilateral sudden sensory neural hearing loss. I mean, lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. We may have a rapidly progressive sensory neural hearing loss bilaterally with systemic autoimmune disease and about 15 to 30%. The immune-mediated Meniere's disease, um, you know, again, that, that's a little bit broad definition of it. The bilateral Meniere's disease, and these often don't present, you know, one, they don't present simultaneously often, but it may be a short time, one to the other. And one that, um, especially you fellows, I talk with you about, delayed contralateral endolymphatic high drops. Uh, one doesn't even have to have Meniere's in the other ear to de develop this. They may have had a sudden loss, maybe that was immune mediated, and then the opposite ear begins to develop classic Meniere's symptoms, vertigo, localizes, etc. The uh, rapidly progressive loss with an inflammatory disease like otitis media, um, and again, immune mediated sensory neural loss, we've already touched on that. And I, I disagree with the, putting the non-immune, rapidly progressive sensory neural hearing loss like a, a drug toxicity. I mean, I think that you're maybe talking about something else there. So what are the etiologies of Meniere's disease? Um, what we're going to touch on are three of those on the usual suspect list. We're going to talk about auto-inflammatory, autoimmune, is it post-viral, is it allergic? If we're going to talk about autoimmune inner ear disease, we first have to define what do we mean by autoimmune. 
And to do that, we have to just take a very brief, I promise you, uh, prom uh, primer on what we mean by innate versus adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is what you're born with. We are hardwired to have innate immunity. Uh, if you know baby's born and there isn't something to protect it, it's you're, it's going to die like within minutes of birth. You know, trauma of birth, entry of uh, bacteria, etc. So the, it's non-specific. It's things like skin as your first, you know, your first barrier against disease. There are certain tell, cell types that are just there all the time for protection, and they don't have to have been stimulated before. Macrophages, mast cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, etc. Complement. We can contrast that with an auto-inflammatory disease, which is a systemic disease that results from an abnormal response to cells of the innate immune system. The one, there may be a genetic predisposition to whether one develops a true autoimmune reaction, and the symptoms can mimic infection. In this case, there has to be a prior exposure, and then things have been primed and an immune response comes into place here. Um, pardon me, it has to be, uh, pardon me, I'm getting to the wrong slide with this. This is an abnormal response of the innate immune system that may be a genetic mutation. And we get symptoms that may mimic an infection, you know, fever, rashes, et cetera. And there, there are some diseases now or some uh, conditions now we recognize that. Familial Mediterranean fever, uh, Muckle Wells. And there's a question about it with COVID. Is this an immediate, you know, a cytokine storm we're getting in those patients who have pulmonary collapse and edema within a short period of time? That is, that is a suggestion with it. Adaptive immunity is what we usually think of as immunity. Here you have to have prior exposure to a pathogen. They have to, we have to have been able to adapt to that prior exposure. This is where we get into humoral immunity, where antibodies are produced, or the cell-mediated immunity with T cell. An abnormal response in this, overly aggressive, is what we, did, what we call an autoimmune disease. Now, whatever it is, whether it's autoimmune, viral, whatever, the clinical characteristics of Meniere's disease are consistent with some inflammatory stimulus in there. And if you think about it, we have intermittent symptoms that go through periods of remission. Um, it's usually worse with, quote, stress, like a lot of other inflammatory conditions. It is often, there's often a seasonal or weather-related uh, response to it. And in allergy, and in inhalant allergy, we definitely have seasons where you're more likely to get an inflammatory response. If, say, all of pollen is in the air, you're sensitized to that. We get that Meniere's and migraine overlap as well. So, at least in my brain, uh, a unifying concept I have of Meniere's disease, I'm going to generalize is, there has to be first some endolymphatic sac abnormality, and then we have to have something that causes an inflammatory trigger. And that can affect the membrane permeability, affect absorption or secretion of endolymph. We get the increased uh, volume in the endolymphatic space, and we get, uh, we get high drops. So what is the data that there's something wrong with the endolymphatic sac in the first place? It's actually quite strong. I'm going to show you a couple of slides by the late Fred Linthicum, who uh, did some very, very good temporal bone and uh, PCR studies on the endolymphatic sac. So this slide shows in the, um, in the x-axis, what it's showing is matched pairs of, patient, of, temp, of uh, sac specimens of patients who are normal and those with Meniere's. The normal are in the kind of a goldenrod color, I guess I'd call it. The Meniere's are in the turquoise. And again, you're seeing matched pairs if you're going across the x-axis. As you're going up the y-axis, what you're seeing is the measurements of surface areas of these. I think what's clearly very, uh, what's very clear in this is there's a significantly smaller size in the endolymphatic sac of patients with Meniere's disease, just astro, I told you there had to be a dog involved here somewhere. Um, I, don't, I don't want to know what he's chewing up. Um, anyway, there's a significantly smaller size endolymphatic sac in patients with Meniere's disease compared to normal controls. And then what about the immunology of the inner ear? Is the immune, is the immune response of the, uh, of the sac, is you know, the immune response of the inner ear, you know, where is that defined? 
Well, it turns out there's a whole lot going on in the endolymphatic sac. Excuse me just a minute while I take this away from the dog. Mm -hmm. Astro. Too late. Okay, <laughs> it turns out there's a lot going on immunologically with the endolymphatic sac in the inner ear. It uh, is capable of having both an innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. And on the latter, we, fi we find the presence of IgG, IgM, and IgA in the sac. We know that from an allergic standpoint, uh, we can have an IgE-mediated degranulation of mast cells. And with that, we can develop endolymphatic high drops and perisacular eosinophilia. And I'll talk about that in just a few more slides here. Now, what are the possible inflammatory triggers of this in increase in uh, endolymph secretion? Because we have an abnormal sac, what's going to cause the inflammation that can, can evolve and uh, devolve, I guess I'd say, <clears throat> devolve into Meniere's disease? It could be an autoimmune stimulus, viral, or allergic. And let's look at autoimmune first. The quote, autoimmune Meniere's disease is theorized to be a type 2 or a type 3 gel and Coombs hypersensitivity reaction. And I'm sure you uh, fellows remember this, you know, really, really well about what this is. And I can't put you on the spot because we're having this Zoom call with the dog in the background uh, tearing up my lecture notes. But uh, with the type 2 and 3 reactions, we, uh, what we do know in Meniere's, pardon me, in a type 3 reaction, is we have increased levels of serum immune comp uh, serum circulating immune complexes in patients with Meniere's disease. Uh, that has been shown. Uh, a th one theory on this is that because whatever has stimulated this, patients with Meniere's who have this increased level of circulating immune complexes uh, have them deposited either in the streal vessels or in the endolymphatic sac, which can increase the vascular permeability. And that is anatomically quite possible because the sac has a fenestrated blood supply. It's, a, it, it doesn't, it's not protected by the blood labyrinthine barrier that the rest of the inner ear is. So it would be a portal to introduce autoantibodies into the inner ear. And that again, that the combination of a, a sick sac, if you will, and the inflammatory response could lead to that production of high drops. And many of the clinical findings of Meniere's disease also suggest there's some sort of an autoimmune trigger, just like we tend to think about with AIED, even in unilateral Meniere's. The symptoms are often steroid responsive, and I'm going to qualify that by saying steroid responsiveness does not mean autoimmune. You know, if you have a you have a you scratch yourself and it's it's very swollen and uncomfortable, you put some steroid cream on it, it gets better. You know, that's not an autoimmune reaction. It is an inflammatory reaction if the steroids can give some benefit. There is an increased, uh, there are a number of increased hereditary factors seen in Meniere's disease patients, 20 to 50%. We see increased incidence of HLA antigens um, in different uh, racial groups, which again is common in autoimmune diseases. We have elevated anti-thyroid peroxidase and ANA levels in 60% of patients with Meniere's disease. And we don't find that in your garden variety, unilateral vestibular paresis, you know, say after a, a sudden hearing loss. Going again to temporal bone findings in AIED, we have to take those with a grain of salt because the temporal bone findings we have are very often due to a patient who meets that clinical description and also has a systemic autoimmune disease. And remember, that's present only about you know, 15 to 30% of the time. So we don't know how much we can extrapolate into your non-systemic associated AIED. But findings we do find in this group and then in others that don't have a systemic disease, what we find in common, there's often fibrous tissue or new bone formation in the cochlea or around the sac. Uh, the streal vessels are atrophied, varying hair cell loss, and we also commonly find endolymphatic high drops. What about viral? The, the theory here is uh, it, it's, need, it's not surprisingly involving the herpes simplex virus. And the herpes simplex virus is smarter than all the rest of us. Once you get it, you get it. You never get over it. You either have an infection or it's lying latent in the body. 
So the theory is you have that initial herpes simplex infection. It can be introduced either via the round window uh, where we get unilateral meniers, or maybe, uh, maybe through the bloodstream where it results in bilateral meniers. Again, it's lying latent. Later, some other kind of something brings it out of, it makes it recrudesce. Uh, I mean, it could be like we say, the <clears throat> fever blister. Uh, you know, the, the under stress, you have a fever in the first place, uh, sunlight can do this, and you develop, uh, you know, you something, this is if we have not herpes labialis, but whatever the immune stressor is in the body, if it's uh, involving the endolymphatic sac is, we get recurrent symptoms, and either the virus itself causes the problem, or it's the direct it is the inflammatory reaction to the virus like we, uh, like we theorize happens with a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So in that case, secreted immune mediators uh, or cytokines are released. They're toxic to the inner ear uh, structures and we develop these symptoms of an ears. There's a lot of evidence supporting this and I tend to be one that thinks this is a, a very, I think this is a very uh, common or in my mind a very I guess if I was going to put one inflammatory trigger, I had to pick one, I'd probably put this as the leading contender. We already know Meniere's patients have elevated levels of antibody in the serum and in the paralymph against HSV1, as well as enterovirus. If we look at DNA specimens of CMV virus in that family, we can find it in up to 78% of patients in the, of the endolymphatic sac of patients with Meniere's disease, we do not find it in patients with, say, acoustic neuroma. And there's PCR evidence of HSV1 in the endolymphatic sac in about 75% of patients with Meniere's disease and 8% of controls. And I'll show this to you. This is, again, another slide from the work of the late Fred Linthicum. Um, in this slide, we have the, their PCR strips, just like um, we saw earlier with the Antarctic midge here. But these are PCR findings on this of patients with Meniere's disease, and that's in, I guess I'd call it the midnight blue color. Uh, the, the Meniere's disease, pardon me, on the left, and then the normal controls. What we're looking for are those that are HSV positive in the midnight blue, HSV negative is in the yellow. And if you look at the Meniere's column, what you can see is 21 out of 24 patients are positive for this HSV1. And if we look at the normal controls, only two out of the 23 have that same finding. So what about allergy? Well, allergy gets no respect. Um, allergy is an autoimmune condition. And in fact, it is the most common autoimmune disease, hypersensitivity disease, whatever you want to call it. It is a type one gel and Coombs hypersensitivity reaction. The, it, you know, this is not headline news that there might be a link with Meniere's and allergy. This was first published by Duke almost 100 years ago in 1923. And there were a number of early reports suggesting this, but they were quickly discounted because at that time we erroneously thought they were, that the inner ear was immunoprivileged. Like the blood brain barrier, there was no way one could have an immune response in the inner ear, which clearly is not true. So what are the theories behind why, how you can, say, inhale some pollen and develop Meniere's disease? Well, the first would be consider the endolymphatic sac itself as a target organ of the allergic reaction. When you have an allergic reaction, whether or not it's a food that you're allergic to or a pollen or mold spore that you've been sensitized to that you in inhale or food that you eat, something like this, you have a target organ. You have the inflammatory reaction uh, inflammatory mediators are released, and then there are areas where you have symptoms that produce. It turns out that in the, if we look at the, if we look at where the immune response occurs in the inner ear, it is in the endolymphatic sac. Uh, there was a study by Yan where he systemically sensitized rodents to KLH, and, what, and he did that by um, intraperitoneal injections, showed that he had um, IgE antibodies against this, then or IgG antibodies against this. Then what he did was an intranasal challenge with radial labeled KLH and you know, tracked it to see where it ended up. It turned out you know, the antigen was processed in good old Waldire's ring, uh, familiar to all first year ENT residents. 
And after processing, there was T-cell homing to the endolymphatic sac. So his conclusion was if you put, if you have, if you're sensitized and you put an antigen in the nose, the immune reaction, resulting immune reaction can be in the endolymphatic sac from these lymphoepithelial cells in the nasal pharynx. Another theory is that there are circulating immune complex depositions in the endolymphatic sac. Um, CICs are increased in both patients with Meniere's disease and allergic rhinitis. And in the sac, the, you know, the, the suggestion is that CICs deposited in the streal vessels might result in an increased vascular permeability. That would cause ionic and fluid balance uh, disruption, result in the entry of autoantibodies in the inner ear, and that can cause you know, inflammation, endolymph absorption, uh, et cetera. And this, this, again, there is another mechanism of CIC deposition causing hearing loss because in those patients with Wagner's granulomatosis who have sensory neural loss, this is exactly the mechanism that occurs. What about an interaction between viral, uh, viral antigen and allergic? And the theory here is, okay, you know, you got the virus comes, you know, virus, whatever type it is, that's introduced at Waldire's ring that again causes an immune reaction. There's T cell homing uh, into the endolymphatic sac. And you know, voila, we get Meniere's disease symptoms. And we do know that um, HSV viruses, herpes viruses, are very capable of exacerbating allergic symptoms. They, they are resulted in increased uh, histamine release. It'll damage the epithelium. You know, if you think about it, and you get herpetic lesions in the, the lip, the nose, wherever, genital. It disrupts that epithelial surface, and that can enhance airborne allergy entrance. And the allergy entry can then result in both an early and a late phase immune response. So what's the treatment of Meniere's disease? It's largely a medical disease. Only about maybe 25% of patients have to have something uh, more aggressive than your typical medical treatment for it. I'm going to just point out the first two lines on this slide because in the new Academy guidelines, we are recommending beta histine, which is non FDA approved, but beta histine as well as diuretics as an acceptable treatment for veneers. And in fact, in reviewing all that data, there's no question that the data is overwhelming that beta histine is more effective than diuretics for veneers disease symptoms. And uh, it certainly has fewer side effects. That doesn't work. What do we do that targets? We have to target the inner ear uh, or the endolymphatic sac in some way. Things aren't working with the diuretics, beta histine. We usually go to steroids. Could be given systemically, could be given by IT injection. We go into antiviral therapies. Uh, they're allergic, we add in, we test them for allergies, put them on allergy immunotherapy, put them on a diet if they have food allergies. If they also have concurrent migraine, we put them on pharmacotherapy. We send them to Dr. Cho, we'd get them on uh, treatment for this. And then of course, for those failures or severe symptoms that just don't respond, we have our, we have our other uh, treatments, uh, a lot of them destructive, IT genomycin, the surgical uh, procedures, of course. And we also may have a role for steroid sparing immunomodulators. Remember, going back to that prior slide, a response to steroids does not mean autoimmune. It means inflammatory. And many patients are both oral steroid and IT responsive. But as you follow them, you're gonna see that many of them become tolerant. They get used to oral and IT steroids, so they just don't work anymore. The long-term results with IT dexamethasone are quite variable. Uh, this was a study by Bolea Saguero, where he studied 96 patients with uncontrolled vertigo, a two-year follow-up, gave them IT, and uh, what he achieved was eventually 91% of what he considered good vertigo control. 70% had maintenance of that two years after uh, completing IT therapy. And 23, 26% of them continued to need, require IT uh, dexamethasone on a regular basis in order to keep themselves at bay. So something co you know, constantly going on with that. Let's talk about viral. There are very limited studies to show any use for viral, uh, antiviral treatments for Meniere's disease. We know valciclovir is ineffective in sudden sensory neural hearing loss. 
or unless we give it in the very first few days before most of us have figured out what's going on with it. Uh, we did a study on famcyclovir, and uh, we found, I'll just turn to that slide here, we did a, um, we picked famcyclovir for a study with Meniere's because it, it's felt to have potentially better neural uptake. And bottom line is we did a double blind placebo controlled trial on patients with Meniere's disease, unilateral Meniere's disease, looked at outcomes with them. And after three months of famcyclovir, we had uh, no difference in vertigo out, uh, outcomes. And these were bad patients with Meniere's. They were averaging two attacks a week of vertigo. And at the end of the study, both groups were averaging zero attacks per week. But again, uh, there was no difference between the two groups. But what we did find uh, quite strongly was that there was a uh, patient report much less fluctuation of hearing in patients with Meniere's disease. So what I'd encourage you, you know, you always want to ask patients with Meniere's what's bothering you the most. Don't assume it's always vertigo. And in patients where they discuss it or you see very active fluctuation, it's not burned out hearing, you might want to consider using it. Allergy. I know your eyes are glazing over at this point, but I'm going to just point in this slide that, again, the allergic uh, response is more complex than people give credit for it. There are two phases to an allergic response. Uh, one is the immediate response occur, occurs within minutes, or early phase response that occurs within minutes of exposure. And this is the classic nasal symptoms you think of, the sneezing, the itching, the running, the congestion. It is largely histamine mediated. And we use antihistamines uh, to try to treat it primarily. There is also a late phase reaction that occurs some two to four hours later. And this is associated with the more chronic inflammatory responses to allergy. It's where we really get into chronic nasal congestion, for example, asthma, et cetera. And this is uh, treated, these types of reactions are treated largely with, uh, with, with leukotriene receptor antagonists or with steroids, either intranasally or oral. If the patient has an anaphylactic reaction, we're gonna treat them initially with epinephrine, uh, Benadryl, et cetera, but we're also gonna give them steroids, you know, a shot, oral, et cetera, because we're concerned about what happens with that late phase reaction some two to four hours later. What's the usual therapy when you hear a patient has Meniere's disease and they've been treated, quote, treated for allergy? It's an early phase treatment. They give them some antihistamines, usually something like generic or brand name of Claritin, Allegra, or Zyrtec. They don't help Meniere's because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so they can't get in to do anything to help the inner ear with this. Intranasal steroids, the bioavailability of these is about 0.01%, so that's about how much gets into the bloodstream. If you spray it in the nose, so don't think of it as giving the same as an IT injection, for example. Now, there may be a role for leukotriene receptor antagonists. This was a study by Takeda, where he took 36 guinea pigs and allergically sensitized them to hookworm. And I know for those of you, like Dr. John, that are eating breakfast right now, this is a very appetizing uh, slide, but this is a hookworm, but quite commonly used in studies on allergy because IgE is involved both in allergic, you know, type one, and it is involved in parasitic responses. So you inject one, a research subject with a hookworm, they will develop an IgE mediated response against hookworm antigen. So these were sensitized, you had 36 of them sensitized, nine unsensitized controls, and then uh, he provoked them with hookworm and did studies of the endolymphatic sac at various time periods. He uh, sacrificed the animals at 1, 12, 24, and 36 hours after challenging. And what he found was in the experimental that the sensitized, allergically sensitized group, there were degranulated mast cells in the lumen of the endolymphatic sac in all of them. However, despite the fact that he found degranulated mast cells at one hour after, uh, after stimulation, there was no development of endolymphatic high drops in any of these, so suggesting that there was not any kind of an early phase reaction that was going on that was, uh, that was causing significant pathology anyway. However, later sacrifice at the animals at 12, 24, and 36 hours later showed that all of them had high drops that had developed, none in the control group, so you know, he 
theorized it, put it together, an allergic response occurred. There was degranulation. Not enough occurred with the late, the early phase mediators, histamine, in the first hour to cause anything. But as you followed, it was clearly pathology from that late phase reaction. So knowing that the a primary mediator with a late phase reaction of leukotrienes. He did a second study where he allergically sensitized guinea pigs to the hookworm again. And in his experimental group, he pre-treated them with a leukotriene receptor antagonist, uh, the one that's used in the veterinary model is Pranlucas, not available in the States. And he uh, pre-treated them an hour before challenge. And control group sensitized, he didn't give any pre-treatment to. He did the same time period as, sacri as sacrifice of the animals. What were his results? The leukotriene receptor antagonist uh, treated group had no mast cell degranulation, completely prevented it. And because of that, there was no endolymphatic hydrops that developed. And the untreated group, the allergic group that was not treated before uh, challenge, all of them developed hydrops. And these are showing his results. I think you can see in slide A, Untreated, we can see clear development of endolymphatic hydrops. Slide B, these have been pre-treated with a leukotriene receptor antagonist, and there's no development of hydrops. So I'm bringing this up as a plug. Uh, we are going to be starting very soon. Uh, doctors um, Hodge, uh, Wakova, Karen Berliner, and uh, Chanel Hill and I will be starting a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with a repurposed use of leukotriene receptor antagonist, in this case monoleukast, to see if it reduces the vertigo and hearing loss in Meniere's disease. And I've told both of the uh, co-investigators on this, just remember most of my you know, hypotheses end up being a failure, but there is value to knowing what doesn't work as well as what does work. Uh, this will be our criteria. Um, I'll, I'll put this around later. So uh, hopefully you all can be recommending patients for the trials with it. It'll be an adult, adult and we have to consider uh, we have to confirm they're allergic and then they'll be randomized to placebo or control. And these are our primary outcomes. And again, in the, the length of time we have, I'm not gonna go through that with you. Um, allergy immunotherapy. We know that allergy immunotherapy has been shown to prevent the early and late phase responses uh, in patients with allergy. We know in patients with Meniere's that clinically, there's a significant decrease in vertigo, improved quality of life, stabilized but not improved hearing in patients, allergic patients with Meniere's disease on immunotherapy uh, compared to those who are allergic and not treated. Uh, there are a lot of weaknesses in many of these trials, including mine, because they're not placebo controlled uh, trials on immunotherapy in this group of patients uh, and allergically sensitized patients with Meniere's disease. We don't have trials on placebo versus active vaccination. I can tell you it would be very hard to get patients to enter into a trial with bad Meniere's disease, knowing they have a you know, flip of a coin possibility of six months of receiving uh, weekly placebo saline shots. Um, what about dietary elimination in uh, patients with Meniere's disease? Because the, the first suggestions of allergy were on food allergy. Um, you know, how could they work? How could immunotherapy work? Well, uh, a number of things. If the primary immune response, for example, is viral, you know, viruses are more likely to reactivate in symptomatic allergic patients, get their allergies better, less likely to have that reactivation. Uh, I brought up the thing about late phase mediators. It may block the uh, production of those, like we saw in the animal model. The Th1, Th2 response means you, you switch from a pro-inflammatory to a protective immune response, which allergy immunotherapy can do quite effectively. Targeted treatment, I'm trying to rush through this to get into what we're doing with um, AIED and in some cases the Meniere's. Uh, we don't know the role, if any, of most immunomodulating drugs in AIED. We do know methotrexate is no more effective than placebo in treating patients with AIED, steroid responsive patients. We, uh, we are again, a house was part of a multi-center uh, uh, multi -center trial on methotrexate, double-blind placebo-controlled trial on this on AIED patients. These patients um, had initial steroid improvement. They were switched, randomized to methotrexate versus placebo. 
And whatever improvement we had was lost when they went from 60 milligrams a day of prednisone to 40 milligrams a day. So methotrexate could not hold the immune response in these, this group. We also found in that trial that HSP70 was the flip of a coin in terming, determining who had who, can t who had AHSP, who had um, AIED, what group was likely to respond to steroids. So I think many of us you'll find who do studies on AIED just don't even get HSP-70 uh, much of the time. What about TNF-alpha? Uh, does that play a role in patients with Meniere's disease? Well, TNF-alpha is one of the most pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body. And its responses of TNF-alpha can include cell death or survival, uh, vascular leakage, thrombosis, leuk uh, leukocyte uh, adhesion, etc. And TNF-alpha plays a major role in pathology of ankylosing, spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis uh, in uh, Kogan's in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, and rheumatoid arthritis. We do know a TNF-alpha blocker can give symptom improvement in Kogan syndrome, where again, by definition, one has to have some hearing loss. We also know that TNF-alpha, the baseline is elevated in patients with AIED compared to normal controls. And the response, uh, response and immune response and how much damage in the cochlea occurs may be related to dependency on TNF-alpha. We did a study because TNF-alpha is, is common in so many different autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases. So we did an open label study where we did intratympanic injections of the TNF-alpha blocker golimumab, which is a human uh, monoclonal an, um, uh, TNF-alpha blocker. We took 10 patients with steroid dependent AIED uh, and many of these were bilateral Meniere's. That's a very common presentation of uh, AIED. These were bad patients. I mean, we're talking steroid dependent, could not get them off of steroids without either uncontrolled vertigo or tanked hearing. The average duration of their symptoms had been 12 and a half years. The average daily prednisone dose of this group was 18 milligrams per day. So this was, this was, you know, this was a pretty major stuck group on prednisone, I guess I would say. We did, uh, we took the vials of golimumab or the uh, golimumab comes as an injection, a subcutaneous injection. So we switched that, did IT injections with them. And once they had the injection, we did a very rapid taper of steroids. Our results out of this group, we had all subjects that we were able to get off of the steroid. They could dis they either discontinue it or they could decrease it to a very, very low number. The majority, seven out of 10, were completely able to get off of their steroid. Three out of 10 decreased it from an average of 18 milligrams a day to seven and a half milligrams per day. The hearing, what happened with the hearing in this group? Well, the pure tone average in four out of the seven that were able to get off steroids improved or were stable, three out of the seven decreased. The word recognition in all patients uh, were measured and seven out of the 10 improved or were stable, three out of the 10 were worse. So, you know, the take home from this was it didn't work for everybody, but for the majority of these worst AIED patients, if we gave them TNF out, if we went ahead and gave them golimumab, we could get them off of steroids or a significantly lower dose. You can get them below 10 milligrams a day. You've done something to health overall health. I'm bringing this up because TNF-alpha is not the only potential target we may have for AIED. Um, there may be a role for interleukin-1b. The interleukin family are significant regulators of autoimmune and inflammatory disease. And we see an unopposed expression of IL-1b in other autoimmune diseases. And we also find this particular interleukin is elevated in steroid non-responsive AIED and sensorineural hearing loss. It's found in Michael Wells syndrome also, which sensory neural hearing loss can be found in that as well. And in that particular problem, it can be improved or resolved with IL-1, with IL-1R uh, blocker and anakinra. So again, this may be something to play around with in the future in those patients with suspected AIED that especially don't respond to steroids or you can't get off of steroids. I put this down because hopefully we'll have more information about this, but not, uh, not necessary about Anakinra because uh, 
Dr. Christopher is going to be doing a retrospective analysis of our treatment outcomes in patients with AIED, various treatment modalities, and see if we can get some sense of what we're actually really doing. So what are the current treatment implications on this? I'd say the history suggests what you could do right now. If you get a very rapidly progressive or less fluctuating um, type of hearing loss, AIED or Meniere's, consider autoimmune and think about potential therapies for that. Bilateral, more likely autoimmune or allergic. Symptom onset with URI fever, think about viral. Um, history of shingles, herpes labialis, start asking that in patients and you'll find out how many of them will associate the onset of bad vertigo when a fever blister came out. Um, clearly, if they have symptoms suggestive of allergy, seasonal, et cetera, think about allergy in terms of treatment modalities. Family history, autoimmune or allergic. If they have another known autoimmune disease, uh, and I'll say one of those besides allergy, um, consider that it may be an autoimmune manifestation. The delayed contralateral end lymphatic high drops, frankly, you can see with any of them, you may have, or you may have it go out of go out of uh, remission, if you will, with any of those other stimulations. So what else can you do with any Meniere's patients? You know, the things we talked about already, give them some goals. Instead of telling them low sodium diet, tell them 1500 milligrams a day. That's what the Heart Association recommends we all should be eating. The average American eats, you know, three to 4,000 uh, milligrams or three to 4,000 milligrams per day. So get them on a healthier diet. They all want something. Tell them to take anti-inflammatory foods. It's not going to hurt the Meniere's and it's probably going to help their general health. On this slide, because uh, I'm asked this all the time by patients, what else can I you know, do? What supplements can I take? So from the cancer literature, where I can find it, I have some of these commonly known anti-inflammatory agents. I have the dosage or range that apparently has a known anti-inflammatory response. Uh, we've got handouts with this. Give them something like that to do and address their concerns. They, you know, they always want to know what they can do and they're going to be, you know, go on disability the rest of their lives. Uh, most activities don't need to be limited in patients with Meniere's disease. The exception, I think, should be scuba diving. It could be catastrophic to have a vertigo attack when you're underwater at depth and also say you've had a, you've had a you know, mastoidectomy for SAC, et cetera, and potentially to get cold water caloric stimulation would not be a good idea in a patient with Meniere's disease at two atmospheres. It's okay for them to fly. I certainly have patients with Meniere's disease that are pilots. You all know that Alan Shepard, the astronaut, had Meniere's disease and could successfully go out to space. Tell them you're not going to let them go deaf. I mean, tell them, you know, we have hearing aids if we need, you know, cochlear implants, you know, I always phrase it as, you know, when, if we got to the point hearing aids weren't adequate enough for your hearing. I mean, you don't have to tell them your secrets. They're going to go deaf and then you're going to give them an implant, but let them know you can continue letting them hear. And, you know, we can virtually always stop vertigo. The medical reasons, you know, the, the destructive, I mean, you know, vestibular nerve section, labyrinthectomy, we can stop it. And then so you fellows don't get awakened in the middle of the night, give them their own rescue medication. Uh, you know, the, the Zofran, the Anavert, Valium, et cetera. The final two slides I'm going to leave you with, I have the sense that everything works with Meniere's disease for a while until it doesn't, and hopefully we'll have more data in the future that'll give us more specific, you know, usually works for Meniere's disease types of uh, symptoms. So I'm going to summarize this. The etiology of Meniere's disease is probably multifactorial. Most patients with Meniere's disease probably have either a developmental or uh, somehow an attained functional abnormality in their endolymphatic sac and their endolymphatic flow. And then they have to have a second inflammatory, they have the trigger, they have to have a second inflammatory spark to set the trigger off and get Meniere's disease. And hopefully in the future, we can be more specific at targeting inflammatory triggers of the inner ear in patients with Meniere's disease. Music